My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Thursday, November 8th, 2012, and I'm interviewing Kickapoo bead artist Judy Kosher for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at Judy's home in Mounds, Oklahoma. Judy, you've won a number of awards in beadwork on cultural items, and your works are in the permanent collection of several Oklahoma museums, including Philbrook and Gilcrease. You also make traditional clothing and have taught workshops in a number of areas. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. <laughs> where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma, and I grew up in and around Shawnee. Uh, what did your dad do for a living? He was a leather craftsman. As I remember, your grandparents on both sides were gone when you were growing up, but you learned a lot about Kickapoo ways. Besides your dad, were there any other extended family members important to you growing up? My great uncle and his wife, uh, my great grandmother, um, we had an older cousin, my dad's niece, and that's about it. Did you grow up speaking your language? No. But you were exposed to your dad's leather work. Did, mm -hmm. How did that impact you as a child? Well, um, he, he was gone a lot because that he had to go where the work was. And um, when we lived in Shawnee for the first four years of my life, he didn't really do much work at home. It was after when we moved to the country near McLeod he um, had all his tools and his, he had a huge granite rock that he did his uh, stamping on and um, it was there that, you know, I noticed that for the, he could sit for the longest time and work <laughs> and, I, you know, you're, you're a kid going in and out of the house and you just don't even think about things like that. But I, it was later that I realized that, you know, while he was working on his stuff, he was also, um, he would sing. Well, he would sing to himself. And um, I think that's where I got that because um, it's not that I sing to myself <laughs> when I'm working. It's just that, you know, uh, you can do a lot of thinking when you're working with your hands. Boy, did you have any family members around you who beaded growing up? No. What about like art classes at, at school? Did you get to take any art classes when you were in yeah. elementary or junior high? Well, not not that not that kind of art classes. I mean they, they let us draw and I always enjoyed that, and it wasn't until I got into college that I was able to take drawing classes. What did you, let's see, you went to college where? St. Gregory's, uh, one semester at OCU, and I graduated from OU. So what were your, um, what was your reaction when you got to take those first art classes? I liked it. Was it drawing, or drawing and painting, or? Um, I, it was charcoal. I, that's all I remembered was it was charcoal, and I just really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. When did you start becoming interested in beadwork? Um, when I was about twelve years old, my great aunt gave me a loom, and I slowly started acquiring beads and learned different techniques. Um, we used to go to this friend's church and, and every summer they would send us to this, this camp up there in northeast Oklahoma and one of these, la there was a lady up there, she taught us how to make beaded medallions. Well, I was watching the others do it and I listened to her and <clears throat> These other girls that were in that, that little group were having a hard time. And so I just explained to them what they were supposed to be doing. I wasn't, I wasn't actually doing the beating, you know, I just explained <laughs> to them. And they, they looked at me really odd, wondering, 
how come I I knew when I wasn't working on anything and you know anyway that was our first my first experience with that but over the years I've um, just kind of looked at things and kind of wondered how they were made and a lot of people have say that you know they can't they can't learn techniques from books well I can <laughs> which is kind of unusual but I don't know it's, it's just always come natural to me and I was wondering, did you do a couple of pieces on your loom too then, where she got the beads that you needed? For... Uh, yeah, it's, it was, you know, I kind of liked that in the beginning, but after so many years, I got burned out with that, so I don't hardly do any loom work now. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of young women will get into making, oh, earrings for extra money or, you know, things like that, but you, uh, that's, you know, they'll do that for a while and then they won't really bead after that. What prompted you to continue your bead work? Well, we lived out in the country and for the longest time our only means of transportation was just to go to school, by school bus. Um, and then uh, we went to this friend's church, like I said, and they would come pick us up on Sunday, so there was another way to go someplace. And unless uh, my great uncle came for us, we didn't go anywhere, and so there, we lived in a crowded house, and other than school and going to the church once a month, once a week, there really wasn't a whole lot to do. Um, so it kind of gave me something to do. Right. And um, the it was in, until I was in junior high that. The um, people that were at the church changed, and they got a couple in there, and they were interested in, you know, everything about the tribe, or the people that would go, the, from the tribe that would go to that church, and they started buying beadwork, and they were interested in my stuff, so gave me a little spending money. Right. Not that I had any place to go <laughs> spend it. <laughs> Well, I think dancing has been important to you for a long time. Um, were you also starting to powwow dance a little bit in in your teens, or? Yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think I got my love of dancing from my great grandmother. Um, she was dancing. For, years and years and years and I think that if she hadn't fallen and broken her hip when she did she probably would have danced until the day she died mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. anyway uh, yeah that's and also didn't you um you're a jingle dress dancer for, did you dance competitively for a while did you and yeah <laughs> <laughs> and did you make your own clothing and your yeah. beadwork and stuff? Yeah, everything. So I was kind of wondering if when people saw, you know, your beadwork, your clothing, if that spurred requests for, you know, could you do me? <laughs> could you do something for me? Could you make me a dress? Could you? Well, I was very selective in who I made dresses for. Um, it, it, for one thing, the... Uh, material for all of it was very expensive and so like I said you know I was very selective in who I, who I made made dresses for as far as the um, things like the moxins and the leggings you know that was even more expensive and mm -hmm. you know, I just mm -hmm. didn't want to do that of course the, and the sewing part requires a sewing machine when did you first get access to a sewing machine before or after I got married. <laughs> before, yeah, I guess before you got married. <laughs> um, there was an old treadle sewing machine that we had. And, uh, At the house? Yeah. My great-grandmother had one and we had one, so, you know, that's where I learned how to sew. And then we were required, I think when I was a freshman in high school, uh, we were required to take home ec. And I was introduced to an electric sewing machine. And 
I didn't like it as much as I did that <laughs> old trail. Why not? <laughs> I don't know, it just seemed like you had more control. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. When did you start? Uh, did you? Uh, and I don't know if you did set ever set up just at. Uh, powwows and sell beadwork. I don't know if you did that as well. Did you do a little bit of that? Uh, I think I was like in a freshman in high school and there was a group of other, I guess, bead craftsmen and people that did arts and crafts uh, from the native population in Shawnee. Uh, we got involved with them and they put on a craft show and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I don't remember if I sold anything or not, but it was, <laughs> gosh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> what, what, was, what was fun about it? Um, just seeing what everybody else was doing. Being around people and showing your work. Um, and there weren't any little um, Indian stores or gift shops in town that you would occasionally sell to. Mm -hmm. I, now you did um, go to Northeastern, I guess, State College then for a while, didn't you? When I, after I, well, I was an, uh, after I got out of OU, I got into a graduate program there. Okay. But I didn't like it. Hmm. Well, talk to me a little bit about being at OU. You um, had taken some art classes, I guess, previously. Did you take any more at OU? Uh, I took a life drawing class. And what was your major? Political science. <laughs> <laughs> and what didn't you like about the NSU program? Uh, I just didn't like being over in that area. Mm. When and where did you meet George, your husband, George Kosher? Well, it was, uh, I want to say about 19, it was in the 70s. And there used to be this powwow in Shawnee. And my parents, my, especially my dad, he never wanted us to stay after the power was over because of the things that went on. And my cousins, they lived in Shawnee, but they camped out at that powwow. And anyway, they, had, they she got her mother to ask my dad if I could stay, spend the night with her. And he said, okay. And I was, I was shocked, but anyway. <laughs> So we were walking around after the powwow, and she had uh, run into some people that she knew, and so she was talking and visiting with them, and then um, I'm standing there and didn't really know anybody, and so I'm just standing there watching everything that was going on, and pretty soon I saw this guy kind of making a beeline for her, and he, he just kind of stood out <laughs> because... I. I know people wore hats, but he, he had this big straw hat on, a uh, cowboy hat. And so anyway, uh, he went over to her and then pretty soon she was really laughing and he, he just kept, you know, I guess he was, he was um, teasing her. And so anyway, um, and then after a while he moved on. So she came over to where I was and I asked her, who was that guy? And then she said, oh, that was George Kozer. He's always after me. <laughs> and so then, um, What was weird was um, there's a uh, state park in Illinois, it's called Kickapoo State Park, and they were having some kind of celebration. I think this was 19, I want to say 70, 72 or 73. Anyway, um, I was part of a group that went up there for that, and George was one of, George was one of the singers, and I had no idea. <laughs> Saw him again. <laughs> no, I, I didn't even know he was there. Oh. But anyway, <laughs> it wasn't until after we were married we were kind of uh, talking about things that we had done, and he told me, and 
I, I had no <laughs> idea he would, he would have been there. Had he spotted you, though? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I was still in high school, and he was, he was in, um, I guess he was in college. <laughs> when you two got together seriously and um, got married, or w when did that happen? 1989. Mm -hmm. And um, had you undertaken a really large beading project prior to that? No. I mean, so what was your first really major piece? Um, fully beaded leggings, a belt, and hair ties, a bread for myself. Mm. Everything was based on a pair of moxes that had been made for me. Were there any special challenges doing that? accumulating the beads because <laughs> yeah. I, I had never I had no idea how many you know how much it was going to take for the background mm -hmm. um, I just do that's what I wanted to do is have everything based on those moxins and I did it how long did it take um, I'm gonna say about a year mm -hmm. they were beautiful when did you begin entering your bead art in competitive shows Say 1994. What was one of the first shows that you entered? Red Earth. Mm. So, <clears throat> can you describe a little bit what that was like to enter your first competitive show and what you well entered? Um, I told George that was what I wanted to do, and he supported me in so many ways. That's what I did, and. As far as entering work competitively, I hadn't really thought about it, but I had um, some beaded moxin flaps for a pair of Kickapoo moxins, and um, I didn't have the actual moxin that they go on, but anyway, that's what I, I entered the flaps, and I got second place. Mm. And they, they have a little prize money with that, too. Mm. What... Um, what was uh, interesting about that show for you? That first it show. It was something I hadn't tried. Mm -hmm. As you began um, entering uh, other shows, who were some of the beat artists whose work kind of stood out for you? Well, I I did I went back the next year and entered and I won. Um, first place. Mm. I think two, two, two items or something. Anyway, um, but I'm one of these kind of people where you know I kind of set my set a goal for myself, and then when I reach that goal, I don't have to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I can move on to something else. Well, I did that. I accomplished what I you know set out for myself, and so. Um, I kind of stopped, stopped entering competitions after that. Mm -hmm. You'd won second and first. Mm -hmm. um, were there a lot of bead work entries at that time? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking there weren't as many as now. What do you think is the difference between bead art and bead craft? Or is there a difference? Well, it just kind of depends on what, what kind of item you're talking about. I mean, I like to do traditional things, things that people might use in ceremonies, people that want to, you know, wear with their traditional regalia. And I'm not just talking about for powwows. Um, I think I stopped doing arts and crafts a long time ago. Because you and uh, George are both, were both active on the powwow scene, you traveled out of state quite a bit. Um, were there uh, places out of state that you took your bead art to sell? No. Mm. I never, never, <laughs> never. 
I just wanted to um, welcome we I, I we went up to Wisconsin and um, several times and when I'm up there all I want to do is dance. Mm hmm. And also, um, do you are you watching beadwork patterns and styles up there too? And mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Uh, I think I, you told me once that the Kickapoo and the Ho Chunk are kind of closely related. Or did I get that? We're all Great Lakes people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or you know, kind of from that area. So, what are some of the other um, rewards of, of going up north? Like that. The forest, the mm. trees. It, to me, it's almost like going home. Mm. Mm. Uh, one of your early major works that I remember was the otter skin bag that's um, currently owned by Phil Brook. Uh, can you talk about that bag, how, how you got the initial idea to do that? My great-grandfather was a full-blood sack and fox, and from what I understand, he was the, he was in the Medewan society, and he was the, like the tenth level, and that's, you know, really important. Um, it, to me, it was just to, to honor his, to honor his, him. Mm -hmm. Can you um, explain just a bit about the Medellin Society. No. All I know is that it died out in the 30s. Mm -hmm. What kinds of um, research did you do for the bag? I looked at um, other bags and I saw a design that I wanted to try and I didn't realize how difficult it was until I started working on it, but mm -hmm. I challenged myself and I got it done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be... Uh, there were some people that saw it and they thought they did it on a loom. There's no way you could get that design on a loom. Every, every line of that beadwork, you had to do it row by row and mm -hmm. beads had to match up for that design and I did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an amazing piece of work. When you say that you did did some research, was it like book research, or did you travel any place too, or go to museums? <laughs> A lot or? of book research. Okay. <laughs> um, what about bandolier bags? When did you become interested in trying one of those? Yeah, for. For my tribe or for George's? Well, I guess your first, let's talk about your first one first. Okay, um, well, George is Muskogee, and they wear bandolier bags, but theirs are different from the Great Lakes area. And so um, I wanted to weld that. I was just told about somebody was interested in, in that, and so anyway, I did you know, research designs, and I found, figured out how they were made from, it, it's not like there's patterns out there for you to follow <laughs> or anything, so anyway, I, that's, that's what I did, I figured out, you know, what designs I wanted, and I gathered the material, and it's, it's expensive, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, um, the wool alone was like $75 a yard, mm -hmm. and, this is like trade cloth we're yeah. talking about, yeah. 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 And so um, I did it. Of course, I didn't know how it was going to um, turn out because I had never, never uh, worked sewn on wool, wool before, but it turned out pretty good. Yeah, it's a beautiful bag too. Um, Can you talk about j just uh, a few of the differences maybe between, and maybe this will bring up your second bag, between Great Lakes style and Muskogee style bags? They're, 
they they be their designs, but they don't fill in the background. And gray leg style, you you bead your design, but you fill in the background. And there's beadwork on the strap on both of them, but the background's not filled in for the Muscovies and the um, actual. Um, it's it's kind of like the actual pocket that you know you could put things in. It's a lot bigger, mm. and they have the Muscogee. They have, um, I guess you call them tassels, mm -hmm. and the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of times those are loom beaded, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, I think you just have to see. So you, just, <laughs> you, you you would you would you could see the difference. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that you weren't seeing a lot of bandolier bags outside of museums when you did, when you started doing them. Um, and you do see a number, you know, not a whole bunch, but you see bead workers doing a number of bags these days. Do you have any feeling for, had you seen any in... Uh, competitions or had you seen any bead workers working on bags before you did that first one? No, uh, not before I did the first one. Um, there's mostly things like, you know, you might see in a museum mm -hmm. or in um, books about bead work or mm -hmm. bead art. Um, so that's where I got my my ideas. And I know a long time ago those designs had meaning, you know, and while I wouldn't want to go and, and, and do somebody else's tribal work. I felt like, you know, I'm married to George, and so um, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I did it. And and when people saw George's bag, there was a positive reaction, wasn't there? Oh, he, he didn't. Ha he's never had a bag. He's... But anyway, um, it's it's the reason why I did that was to honor his... his uh, He's tried. Right. Because I'm married to him. Well, um, Phil, uh, Gilchrist was interested in it. And so we took it over, he took it over there because he's my agent and he, he showed them and talked to them and everything and they bought it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I meant to say when, when other Muscogee Creeks saw that bag, they responded positively. To, to, to see in a bandolier bag that was Muscogee style. Um, when did you make your first pair of moccasins? <laughs> what kind? <laughs> <laughs> Kickapoo moccasins. Well, that would have been... Yeah, just go ahead and talk about uh, that. <laughs> because uh, they use uh, smoked tan deer hide, brain tan deer hide, mm -hmm. and those are hard to come by. Um, I think I had used some of my prize money to, to buy some hide, and so um, made made my own pair. But what I did, I had a pair that my uh, one of my... Um, cousins had made. She was a really older lady and she was famous for her work or for her moxins anyway among the tribe but anyway she um I had a pair of hers and she um what I ended up doing was since she was she wasn't around to show me I took it apart and I figured it out. Mm -hmm. and so anyway, that's how I learned how to make my own moccasins. Mm -hmm. And then you learned how to make creek style moccasins too, right? <laughs> it's not much different. <laughs> um, did you, I remember you gave a workshop, didn't you? No. Did you, oh, you didn't. Okay. But, um, but you have a few, year, a few oh. years ago, um, Limpool schools, there were, um, one of their native Creek classes wanted, the teacher asked me if I could teach her kids. And 
So I went over there and I tried. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, I'm not a teacher. That's all I can say is I'm not a teacher. You know, either they got it or they didn't. And from what I, some, of the, some, of, some of the ones that I saw, they didn't get it. <laughs> Um, of the commissions you've had, what what posed the greatest challenge? What was your? Oh, I find it very inhibiting. I don't like having a deadline, and I don't like having to, you know, what something very very specific. It's just I don't know. It kind of mm. zaps my creativity. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you know, I know, I knew a lot of times I've got to get this done, and it just, it's just really hard sometimes. Mm hmm But I, I do remember times when you had both, you know, clothing <laughs> and beadwork that you were working on both simultaneously for somebody. Would you like switch off quite a bit to kind of help you? yourself get through that or yeah um kind of breaks the monotony mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> time-consuming work what's what's one of the most exciting places you've traveled either maybe as part of research for your art or just as part of um a cultural cultural kind of exchange or um, we got to, we went through Chicago on our way to to uh, Wisconsin once, and I got to stop in the museum there and see a lot of incredible things, and we went out to, we stopped in Milwaukee and got to go to the museum there and got to go see a lot of incredible things. Wow. Yeah, and a lot of woodland, mm -hmm. probably, yeah. What, what was the most... Um... What was the thing that mo was most moving for you there? In Chicago, there was a, um, they call it dried squash, but I, it was pumpkin, field pumpkin. Mm. And I saw that, and it just about made me cry. Mm -hmm. Because um, my dad used to do that. And dried pumpkin is a way to you know this is before refrigerators or whatever you know um, when you dry it that thing can last for years and years and it was really obvious to me that you know even though it was under glass there's no telling how old that thing was mm -hmm. and anyway we're still doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i think you and george made a trip to germany um, can you talk about that a little and how that... Oh, God, that was a long <laughs> flight. Oh, I don't think I'll ever want to do that again. <laughs> but, it was, it, you know, we stayed with a nice couple, and, and I enjoyed myself around them and everything, but it was really kind of eye-opening to me. And um, probably should explain how, how you ended up going. Well, um, it was... To Tulsa, Tulsa sister city, Sella, Germany. They had something going on, and so anyway, um, they wanted to. Originally, it started out they like they wanted a dance troupe of fifteen. Well, it eventually just dwindled down to George and I. And so, um, well, there was the SARS scare, and and just you know a lot of stuff that was mm -hmm. going on. And so anyway. Um, so um, we went, and he, we uh, were able to, um, part of the thing that we did, we went to a kindergarten, we went to like a grade school, and talked to, to the, we always talked to the kindergarten kids, and um, kind of did a little exhibition for them, and we got them to dance, and then uh, we went to the grade school, and just answered questions, and then um, for um, part of Tulsa's um, thing, I guess every day, everybody, a different city was, sister city would be showcased, and so when it was Tulsa's turn, we were part of the um, exhibition. We did, he, he took a hand drum and he sang and I danced. <laughs> <sighs> That's a neat experience. Um, 
I know beaded collars have been around for a long time, but it seems to me that when you started doing beaded collars, they were some of the first collars that I saw at like art galleries. So again, I think you, you're sort of always ahead of, <laughs> of the curve um, with some of these things. Can you talk a little bit about the collars and, um, and what you try to do with yours to make them stand out a little bit? Well, I, st I incorporated a design in there that's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I came up with my own way to, um, of how you, um, how I kind of figured out how that design's going to come out and everything. And anyway, that's really, really intensive, uh, the concentration. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I will ever want to do that design <laughs> again. How many did you end up making in all? Two or three. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know the Indian Education Program in Glenpool has, has also called on you for just different kind of cultural workshops, and one of the ones that you did was to show them how to dry pumpkin. So could you talk about that experience a bit? Well, um, the Creeks used pumpkins. And when I told Christy, well, she called over here one time and she wanted to know what I was doing. I was telling her and so anyway, she was really interested. And then she wanted to know if I could come do that for her class. Well, usually what we do, we, when those field pumpkins are uh, ready, it used to be you could do that in October. Mm. And she was calling me probably maybe a, a week or two before Thanksgiving. Mm. And it's sometimes it's hard to find those things, or sometimes they're overripe. Well, anyway, so I went over there, and I tried to show her, but... Um, and she went and got the pumpkins, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and it's... Well, it, to me... It's one of these things where it's actually a, a, it's a quiet activity. I mean, you can't have a lot of people around there talking, and you can't have a lot of distractions and everything because you're working with knives, and you kind of have to concentrate on, you know, making your, your pumpkin rings, and they go in a certain order, and just a whole lot of things, and so mm -hmm. anyway. Um, <laughs> when we did it at the school, oh man, that was that was something else. But nobody lost a finger or anything. It turned no, out, yeah. No, but I got several cuts on my hands. Oh. So. Oh. Um. You and George were selected as um, Native Elders of the Year by um, AARP, or was it Triple? Yeah, AARP. AARP here in Oklahoma in 2012. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? <laughs> well, this friend of mine, had, uh, when I had talked to her, she told me that, you know, she was going to nominate us, and so I thought, okay. And then uh, a little bit later she called and she was asking about, you know, different dates and um, some of the things that we had done. So I tried to fill her in and everything. Um, and then, um, I forgot about it, you know, because we had different things that were going on, um, and then um, he got a call back in September, and he thought that, that they were joking. <laughs> you know, he didn't know they were serious and everything, so anyway, they told us when they wanted us to be, uh, they had a, um, kind of like a banquet at the Cowboy Hall of Fame, and they told us when they, when they wanted us to be up there and everything. And, because we had been selected, and it never dawned on me that you know he that I would be selected because I don't think of myself as that uh, as an elder because you know I'm not 60 yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But 
uh, plus I feel like there's probably a lot more people more more worthy than me. <laughs> but anyway, we went and it was different. And wore your traditional clothing. Yeah. yeah. We're going to see some of that and the pumpkin <laughs> at the end of the interview. Um, you were also extras in at least one movie. Has it, was it, has it been more than one? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it started out for that. Um, Charlie Soap is making this um, this movie about when when they about the Bell community, and it's called uh, the Cherokee Word for Water. And um, so anyway, um, there's a powwow scene in there. Well, this friend of mine called me up and wanted to know if, if I could, if I had something that her cousin could wear. I told her, sure, because I thought, well, no, this is another thing I can add to my list that, you know, my work was in a movie. Yes. And so anyway, <laughs> I, I had, um, she, well, that friend of mine had given me a, a crow dress because she's crow in Cherokee. And I kind of changed it around, and there's some other things that I wanted to do to it. But, you know, it was, I, I guess her cousin is probably about as tall as or taller than me. And so anyway, I um, sent my stuff down there, and anyway, um, I thought that was it. You know, I was kind of looking for, I was kind of, kind of really happy that, you know, I could say my work was in a movie. Well, anyway. <laughs> Then she called, she called back and she said that, you know, um, she wanted to know if I wanted to be in it, George and I. And I told her, well, I hadn't thought about it. Cause, and, you know, I told her, I said, I don't really have anything to wear because your cousin's going to be, have, has everything that, you know, that's mine. <laughs> so I, I found something. And then um, there was, we got in and then um, there Something happened with the car, and so then I called up this other friend of mine and asked her if, you know, hey, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> and so <laughs> she said she hadn't thought about it, but she wasn't working at the time, so she said, okay. So I told her, and, and we rode down with her, and so then we went. But the thing was, they said it was a closed set. She wasn't, her name wasn't on the list, but we got her in anyway. And so anyway, um, they did the powwow scene, and... I never realized how long, you know, it, it takes to, <laughs> yeah. to do stuff like that, but anyway, so it's, it's, uh, it's in October, and went down there in Tahlequah, when, when the sun goes down, it does get cold in the evening, and so anyway, um, she, she wore an outfit that I had given her, and so anyway, um, all I know is that well, he uh, Charlie was there, and um, I didn't realize that he still had this beadwork that I had made. Somebody had asked me back in the 80s if I could fix a belt, uh, a harness, a headband. I think that was all. And something that they had, they were specific colors and specific designs. And so anyway, I came up with something. And anyway. Um, I don't remember how much I got paid, but anyway, I did it all. And so um, the guy that plays Charlie in the movie is wearing his outfit. Mm. And I was really kind of shocked. So, wow, it still looks good. <laughs> Either that or he really took care of it. But anyway, um, so um, during one of the kind of like small breaks, and anyway, um, I got up and I went over there and I, I touched Charlie on the arm and I told, told him, I said, I made your beadwork, and he turned around and he looked at me and he was just kind of surprised and he said, really? And I thought, yeah. And I told him uh, who the lady was that had asked me to do all that work and everything and he said, well, you know, it was so weird. I was, I would get pieces in the mail every so often. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I did most of it. They were presents from her. Yeah. She ordered them for yeah. him. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, in addition to the work that um, my friend's cousin has on, right. if, she's, if she's in there, um, then uh, his, my work will, will be in the movie because <laughs> it's Charlie's. Right. <laughs> And I understand that's going. They're going to preview that pretty soon here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's November 29th. Uh huh. At the Circle Cinema? Or no, Jazz say, Hall of Fame. Jazz Hall of Fame. Um, you know, beat, beat art never seems to command the money it deserves for the time that goes into it. Um, do you see that situation improving? In this economy? <laughs> I know, um, you know, both you and George have made important contributions to the Native Society, and George has been a drug and alcohol counselor for many years, but since he's retired, it's, it's tough at times, I imagine. Um, what carries you through? The fact that I have tremendous patience. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you... I don't know, I think as you get older, you kind of think that, you know, is this really something that we want or is it something that we think we need? Mm -hmm. And I found that, you know, the it, it's pretty easy to live simply. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your, um, like, artistic techniques and things, um, process. Um... And you've mentioned that, you know, after a while you just didn't, weren't interested in loom work, so you really didn't do too much of that. Um, on, the, on the different bandolier bags, what, what kind of, um, were you using an embossed stitch or what kind of stitch were you using? I guess they call it an applique stitch. Mm -hmm. Some okay. people can use one needle and you do fine. I used to. Oh, okay. Um, it was interesting you said that when you got your prize money, you went and got supplies, and I think that's artist's favorite thing. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to go shopping for beads, what, what do you look for? Well, um, I guess you should be aware that uh, about five years ago I had a stroke. Mm-hmm can't be the way that I used to. There's some things that I can do and what's weird is I found that I'm, I'm still, I can do weaving really good. Oh. And so anyway, the days of me actually doing, you know, applique work, I think that's pretty much over. Mm -hmm. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and it just doesn't come out the way that I want it to. Mm. And so, um, I'm moving into a different direction now. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some weaving techniques that I really want to try. It's just that, you know, um, other things keep coming up and coming up and coming up. And so anyway, it's kind of hard to mm. um, get around to that. So like sashes, you're talking about weaving or mm -hmm. no, talking about loom? There's there's certain techni techniques you can do with beads. Mm, okay. Oh, that'll be great. I'll look forward to seeing what you do. Have you worked with antique beads a lot on earlier works? or? Yeah, except that I don't really like them because they're so... they're not uniform. Mm. And when you did have commissions um, that were real specific about designs and colors, how did you put your imprint on those so that you could still know it was your work? Well, the way that I see it, anything that I make, it starts up here mm -hmm. and it comes out here. Um, the thoughts that go through my mind when I'm working on something or things that, you know, that the way that I feel when I'm going through that, um, it's mine all the way up until the end. Where it, when it's finished, it's not mine anymore. If it pleases whoever I made it for, that's good. And you know that's that's to me that's the most important part. Part is you know the final product. I can be pleased with it, but it's for who it's for. Mm -hmm. um, if they're pleased with it, okay, I did my job. Do you ever sketch out your designs? Mm, once in a while. Mm -hmm. If it's particularly complicated. Or... 
How about on the bag, the otter skin bag? Um, I think there was a picture in a book and that's where I, I, I got the idea from and mm -hmm. I just went by the picture. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think your um, color, colors, your your palette changed much over the years? Uh, I don't use as many graduated colors anymore. Um, I like I like to see, you know, it's kind of like always a challenge to you know to see what's going to go good with together and everything. So. Mm -hmm. You sort of talked about your creative process a little bit. I wonder if there's anything you can add to that. Like when you get an idea for a piece, do you ever write ideas down or how? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be good. So, what happens after you get the idea? Gather the materials. Mm -hmm. Figure out, you know how big or whatever and, and just sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. Do you like working to music or any, anything? Mm, television yeah, or? I like it when it's quiet. Mm -hmm. What's your creative routine? Do you um, try to work a couple, do you try to work at night or during the day or just when you feel like it, or a few hours each day? What's the routine? Um, Any time after 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, that's what I'm most... I'm not a morning person. Mm -hmm. Well, um, looking back on your career so far, what's been one of the high points? Finishing that great Lex Band bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What did you do? Sometimes it's it's your adrenaline's just so still flowing. Did you you and George sort of just enjoy the moment for an evening or something? Or how did you feel when you finished it? It's a long, <laughs> such a long process. <laughs> I told him, I said it was like giving birth. Uh huh. Of course, it took a, a little over a year, uh -huh. but I got it done. Uh huh. <laughs> it's just that, you know, something that big, it kind of took on a life of its own. If I wasn't in the proper mood, it would let me know because I, all kinds of mistakes would happen and everything, and I'd get frustrated. And so I'd just put it down, and then I'd have to come back to it later. So you had to do some tearing out sometimes, or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> What's been one of the um, low points of your career so far? That bag hasn't sold. Mmm. <laughs> one that we're gonna see today. Mm. Yeah. But that's okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you've, um, you, you know what its value is, you know what price you've put on it, and you, you know, you won't let it go for what it's, less than it's worth. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't get it at Walmart. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And if everybody could make them, then why don't I see more of them? Mm -hmm. What would you tell a young uh, Native person who's interested in earning their living with bead, bead work, bead art? Just be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, things won't always sell. Um, you can follow the trends or you can I don't know, I, I always felt kind of weird if I tried to do somebody else, some other tribe, without their permission. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this friend of mine, she's Cherokee and she's Crow, she asked me to do her beadwork. And so I did, 
And but the thing was, you know, I had her permission. Mm -hmm. I fixed her some crow moxins, crow leggings, um, just things that went along with her outfit just to wear at powwows. Mm -hmm. And but as far as me actually wanting to do any more crow designs after that, uh, -huh. I wouldn't do it because that's not who I am. Um, It's just, I don't know. I think what I'm seeing now is a lot of people, you know, they kind of like to follow these trends. I'm not into that. I just want to do what I want to do. Is there anything else you'd like to add or talk about before we look at your work? Mm. <laughs> just that it, it's... I can't be like I used to. It's kind of hard when you, as I'm getting older. Um, I guess it's arthritis setting in and my eyesight. Plus, it's hard to sit for long times. <laughs> <laughs> but you're thinking about doing some weaving, bead weaving, so we'll look forward to that. Um, can you talk to us about your clothes here? This is a. Um, Applique design skirt. Uh, my great grandmother, she always wore a black shirt with her outfits. Mm. And so this is a black shirt, and then we had the silver buttons on there. Um, a bone and a glass bead necklace. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of a combination of Kickapoo and Sack and Fox because that's mm. who I am. Okay. Beautiful. All right, and how about this bandolier bag? This was done on red trade wool. Uh, most of them are done on red, red and black, but um, this is red. And this is all cut beads, mm. except for a few sections of um, white heart mm -hmm. um, class beads. Uh, the designs come from the Great Lakes. Mm-hmm. And there are the tassels. And the, um, those are loom woven tassels. Mm. Just exquisite. Beautiful, flat, straight work. <laughs> Okay, how about this? Mm -hmm. This is a man shirt. Um, this was an old um, piece of beadwork. I think this was from some of the things that my great grandmother had. Mm. And I took it apart and I restored it. Mm. But this is how the piece would go on the shirt. Mm -hmm. And this is for ceremonial purposes. Uh -huh. Those are just really beautiful designs. I just want to come up a little bit more and get some of the more, more of the designs. All right, thank you.